what, what do you think is, is, a, is a rational allocation right now for somebody who's at, 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 at first and foremost trying not to get destroyed this year? Yeah, and to be clear, I don't give personal financial advice, but at a macro level, I'm happy to talk about what- Absolutely, what, none of this is personal financial advice. Level. Definitely well, talk with an advisor, and I'm going to make that plug at the end here yeah. too. <laughs> uh, portfolio might, might look like. Um, the first thing I say, diversification, the math and the science behind diversification and why it's a good strategy is very clear. That's not much debate about that. The problem is people don't understand what diversification means. They think if they have 50 stocks in 10 sectors, semiconductors, consumer non durables or whatever, they're diversified. And what I say to them is, yours, you may have 50 stocks, but that's one asset class. You're in stocks. And in stressful situations, they become highly correlated. So you're not getting the benefit of diversification. You think you are, but you're not. So what does a diversified portfolio look like? Well, I have a slice of stocks. I'm not anti-stock market, but you got to pick the sectors and the stocks that will do, that will perform well, even in the kind of conditions we're talking about. And I would go back to energy, natural resources, agriculture. So, you know, uh, a marathon, ExxonMobil, Chevron, ADM, uh, Cargill, um, uh, you know, uh, mining companies uh and not just gold gold yeah but um i recently invested in a lithium mine uh i think i think <laughs> i think the the climate alarmists i think the I, I the green new deal i call it the green news scam uh, and this is a scam but it doesn't mean it doesn't have legs whether it's whether you like it or not the fact is uh it's going to go on so the lithium's in short supply uh graphite you know etc so there is a portfolio you can have, which is natural resource oriented, that will uh, do well, even in the kind of tough environment we're talking about. Slug of cash, absolutely, maybe as much as 30%. I like treasury notes, 10-year uh, treasury notes, but you know, season to taste, if it's, if they're a little too volatile, look at five-year notes, two-year notes, they're gonna come down a lot, not right away, not tomorrow morning, but um, sooner than later because of everything we discussed, which is uh, you know, a recession and interest rates will follow. Or lagging indicator, but that'll happen. Um, uh, gold, I always recommend a 10% slice. Um, hey, hey, Jim, real, real quick, before we move on from bonds there. Um, so I've talked to a number of analysts and investors, you know, on this program recently, who have who have echoed what you just said there about bonds. And, you know, there are two really good reasons to hold them, right? Three really good reasons to hold them right now. Um, one is just safety, right? This is a time to prioritize safety. Two, they're paying a lot more than they used to pay. So you're getting paid to sit in safety, which is nice. But then they have that, that option value, right? Where if, if, if the um, Fed does pivot and rates come down, um, yields come down, uh, the actual underlying price of the bond would go up. Correct. And so uh, a number of these guys have said you know, that bonds, particularly the, the sovereign bonds, especially the U.S. Treasuries, they're looking the best they've seen in, in a long while. And, and you know, relatively recently, some have said it's like the best I've seen in my career. So I'm just curious, does do you find that compelling for the moment in time we're in here? Absolutely. There's a, I hate to get too deep in the weeds in terms of bond math, but there's something called a DBO1. DBO1 is the dollar value of one basis point. What that means is, you know, obviously basic bond math, interest rates come down, the value, the, the price of the bond goes up. They're just, invert, it's a little counterintuitive, but rates come down, the bond goes up. The question is how much? And the lower the interest rate, the more the price of the bond goes up for every basis point drop in rates. Mm. So in other words, if you go from 9% to 8%, you'll have a nice capital gain on your bond. But if you go from 3% to 2%, it's still a 1% drop, but you're going to have a much bigger capital gain. You know, in, in each instance, it's a 1% drop in rates, but the amount of capital gain on the bond is much higher you know, as the DBO one is higher when the rates are lower. Again, it's all counterintuitive, yeah, but, but it's sort of like a Richter scale. Each new increment is a much the, higher magnitude. The, 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 the lower the rate, uh, the greater the capital gain on each basis point drop in yields. Yep. That's the basically. So yeah, when you're you, you go from three percent to two percent, that's a home run in terms of capital gains. So you get the yield, you get the safety, you get the liquidity, and if you feel like selling it, you got a nice fat capital gain. Okay, great. Thanks. Sorry to interrupt, but I just thought that was a really important point to underscore. Yeah, I, I agree with the analysts who are saying that. Uh, absolutely. Okay, great. So on to gold, you were saying ten percent ish. Ten percent, but you, you know, but, yeah, but based on what we were talking about, get um, I I would get uh, uh, silver dollars, American silver eagles. Yeah, the monster box. Uh, you know, 
bit of jargon. Monster box comes from the U.S. Mint, treasury green, nice shade of green. It comes with a compression strap. I recommend don't open it, you know, unless you know, do, do not break except in case of fire. But inside are 500 one ounce American silver eagles. That's a lot. Um, they'll feed your family for, you know, probably a year. And uh, it, uh, um, they run, you know, it's, it's a market price, but, uh, you know, be around ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 for a monster box. But to me, it's like, battery and flashlights you know just have one stick in a safe place all right great and i'm curious do you have any uh particular thoughts on silver versus gold right now in your your 2023 yeah. outlook yeah I, I like them both and you know i talk about gold a lot because it's a, a form of money and uh, i do the monetary analysis uh i mean i do invest in gold mines but i don't hold myself out as a geologist but i do think about it from a monetary perspective and then people always say jim what about silver what about silver? I'm like look if, if gold soars the way i expect silver's along for the ride there's there's no there's not going to be a world of three thousand dollar gold and twenty dollar silver that world doesn't exist if gold's at three thousand silver is going to be pushing 100. So without giving an exact forecast, uh, silver will be along for the ride. Silver is a little more difficult to analyze because it has industrial applications. Gold really doesn't. Gold's not good for anything except money, but it's the best form of money. Silver can be, is used in a lot of applications. So if you have a recession, it's perhaps the case that the monetary value is going up, but the industrial input value is going down. So it's a little bit more of a mixed bag, but silver is going to do fine. And I do think it's extremely practical because in a world of CBDCs, silver will be a form of spending money. Gold, even the even the court, even the eight gram coin I mentioned, the quarter ounce American gold eagle, still five hundred bucks. It's like pulling a five hundred dollar bill out of your wallet. You know, it's it's a lot for groceries. Right. So 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 the think of the gold more sort of the store of value and silver more as the the currency. Yeah, but the quarter ounce, you know, maybe uh ten of them get you a new car or something. So yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. For bigger purchases. But yeah. Okay, great. So it's gold. I, I know in the past you've you've said, hey, you know, real estate, private equity, farmland, et cetera. Those are all things to consider as well. Yeah, um, I think it, yeah, yeah, income producing real estate. I wouldn't get into commercial real estate, residential. Uh, yeah, the, the prices are, you know, um, home prices are coming down uh, a little more in some markets than others. But uh, if it's income producing and it's solid and it's a, in a place like, you know, uh, someplace people want to be like Austin or Phoenix or whatever. I mean, I know they're, 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 there's markets down a little bit right now, but, you know, it's like buying a, a 10-year bond. You know, it's got steady monthly income and uh, or certainly farmland. Uh, but in income producing real estate, not commercial office buildings, should be a part of a diversified portfolio. Yes. All right. Great. Um, I got one last topic uh, I want to talk about with you. Before I do, anything else just sort of on... Uh, Actually, let me ask this. So um, we talked there about sort of diversification largely with the eye towards sort of making it through what's coming here. Are there any areas that you potentially think are like, hey, get, given the events that we see coming, yes, while they're a little scary, there's some opportunity maybe to really, if you, if you have some speculative capital, this could be a place that you think could pop really well. Yeah, I mean, I like uh, I, I like private equity, and it's you know you got accredited investor issues and uh, finding good deals and good promoters and good management. But um, you know that, that there are some uh, you know some good deals in the mining sector. Um, I like, uh, and um, uh, well, that, that 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 would be one. I mean, we haven't we haven't really talked about the important things going on, but we'll maybe do that in another interview. Okay. <laughs> um, and, and hey, well, on no, that so, ser ser seriously, everything we talked about is sort of pales in comparison to what's going on in Ukraine. We're kind of on a march toward nuclear war, but maybe we'll talk about that some other interview. Yeah, you know, I th that honestly was the question I had before we got to the allocation here, and I just thought it was such a great big topic that I didn't want to give it too short shrift. But if you're if you're willing to come back on, Jim, would love to really dive into that with you because you're right. I mean, that's. You know, if if we're not around here anymore for a smoking pile of rubble, nothing none of what we talked about matters. 